very backward-looking society. We're backward-looking because it's only human nature. We've all personally experienced the past. We look around, we see evidence of the past all around us. All information that we create is suddenly history. The past is very knowable. And yet we're going to be spending the rest of our lives in the future. So it's almost as if we are walking backwards into the future. My job as a futurist is to help turn people around, to help give people some understanding of what the future might hold. So we're going to take a look this morning at our relationship with the future. We're going to try to understand this bizarre concept of what I call communicating with the future. And so what do we know about the future? We know that the future is constantly unfolding. We know that it's relentless. It's unforgiving. It's going to happen whether we want it to or not. It's like a force of nature that's pulling everything into the future. I always think of the power of the future rather than time. The power of the future is somehow that's a different concept. So the future is going to happen whether we want it to or not. It's not like we can say, oh, I'm not going to go into the future. I'm going to stop right here. That's not allowed. We can't do that. Try it someday. It doesn't work. So if your next project is not aligned with the problems, needs, and desires of the future, the future is going to kill it. Notice that I said the problems, needs, and desires of the future, not of the present, not of the past, but of the future. So I always like to add these human characteristics to the future. Uh, the future is shining brightly on me today. Uh, the future is going to push that one over a cliff. I actually tried to convince my wife that I needed a new car because the future wanted me to have it. <laughs> Didn't work so well. So the question, though, is what we should be asking is, what does the future want? Now I'm going to come back to this in just a second here. But I, I know you're all sitting here thinking, you're a futurist, and so obviously you must have a crystal ball. And yes, I do have a crystal ball. And I was sitting at home, and it was collecting a lot of dust. And my wife says, well, you should just take that to the office. It's, it's just sitting on the shelf here, not doing any good. And so I packed up my crystal ball into my car, and I had a meeting down in Denver. I live in Denver. Had a meeting down in Denver, and it was no more than about five minutes down the road when I looked over, and there was a fire on the seat next to me. Sunshine coming in, crystal ball, giant lens. <laughs> this is Boy Scouts 101, and I blew it. So luckily, I was able to put the fire out, and... There was no real damage. But then, driving the rest of the way down to Denver, I suddenly had this vision of newspaper headlines the next day saying, Futurist killed by his own crystal ball. <laughs> and he didn't see it coming. <laughs> so going back to this question of what does the future want, Let's shift the question a little bit to how does the future get created? Well, the future gets created in the minds of those around us. The people around us are creating the future along with us. If you read Richard Florida's book, The Rise of the Creative Class, he delineates some of the real creative people that have more influence than others. The super creative core and the creative professionals represent roughly 30% of the workforce. But everybody's contributing to creating the future. So people are making decisions today based on their interpretation of what the future is going to hold. So for this reason, we're, we talk about the future creates the present. This is just the opposite of what most people think. Most people think that what we're doing today is going to create the future. Well, from a little different perspective, 
The images that people hold in their heads determine their actions today. That's the basis for all the decisions that we're making. What we think the future holds has a heavy influence on how we make decisions today. So if we change people's visions of the future, we change the way they make decisions today. So we have two choices. We can either work within the parameters of people's current visions of the future, or we can change them. Politicians will work within the parameters of people's current visions of the future. I'm one that thinks that it's much more fun to try to change people's vision. So how do we change people's visions of the future? I'm gonna give you a little background and I'm gonna come back to this question. The familiarity contraction principle. This is a real important one to understand. The first time you drive across a city, you, you drive into a new city, you've never been there before. The first time you drive across the city in this one particular pattern, it seems to take forever. You're very visually aware of everything. You have all these mental cues along the way. Your perceptions are heightened. It takes longer than you uh, than it really does in your mind. And so the more times you make that same trip over and over and over again, it seems to get shorter. You go on to, brain goes on to autopilot. It's similar to when we think about the future. The more we think about it, the easier it becomes for us to work with it. So if we have concepts about the future and we think about it a lot, we can take these concepts, we can roll them around, look at them from different perspectives, inside and out. We, we create something of a relationship with that vision of the future. And it becomes easier to work with. That's the familiarity contraction principle. We also have a relationship with the future, because we're gonna live there. Most of us believe that the future is this random set of occurrences that we have no control over. However, we can predict many aspects of the future with a high degree of probability. As an example, I can predict that this building that we're in today is gonna to be here six months from now. I can predict that with a high degree of probability. The Earth's gonna travel around the sun in the same orbit 100 years from now. Again, with a high degree of probability. Laws of gravity are still gonna be in effect. People are still gonna to need to communicate summers, winter, spring, and fall. All the seasons are gonna occur 100 years from now. If we plant seeds in the ground, a high percentage of them are gonna grow. We know these things. We can even predict that if we plan a birthday party two weeks in the future, that because we have enough control over the elements around us that we can have some degree of certainty that that's going to happen. So most of our future is being planned around this foundation of stable, slow-moving elements that we can predict with a high degree of probability. The areas that we have the least control over is the natural systems, things like the weather, insects, uh, animals, and human systems, things that involve human decisions. So it's the, to the degree that we can somehow manage the natural systems and the human systems that determines how much control we have over the future. So going back to that question, how do we change people's visions of the future? It, it, we, we do it with this process of communicating with the future. And I'll step you through this. It's a four-step process. Incidentally, this is a process that we're working on at the Da Vinci Institute. So it's not fully baked yet, we're getting close though. So first we start by building the vision and we turn it into an attractor and I'll explain what that is. Then we unleash the vision and then we listen to the results through anticipatory analytics. So we start by building the vision. How do we build the vision? Well, we do it through a number of steps. We create a body of work around this vision of the future. And so we, we start by telling stories about it. And then we create storyboards, and then we do graphic art, build models and animations. We do surveys, we do interviews, we 
create videos. All of these things contribute to this idea of what that vision of the future is going to be. Once we do that, then we turn it into what I call an attractor. An attractor is some natural event in the future that we're somehow drawn towards. We have a lot of attractors in our head based on our culture. Things like um, space hotels, flying cars, cures for cancer. We've had these things ingrained in our head that these are going to happen sometime in the future, so therefore uh, we're drawn to that, that end point. So it's a force of nature. It's, it exerts a powerful force on us, pulling us into the future. Leonardo da Vinci, as an example, dedicated over 35,000 words and 500 drawings to the concept of flying. This is over 300 years before the first hot air balloon flight, over 400 years before the Wright brothers. Nobody at this time really thought people could fly. But da Vinci, because he put this, together this body of work, he created an attractor. He made it seem possible that this could happen sometime in the future. So the way we do it is we start by conceptualizing the idea and then we add dimension and realism to it. This is what Madison Avenue has been doing for years. They do advertising campaigns, they take these new products that nobody is using yet, <clears throat> and they create visions of how this gets integrated into our lives. And so the idea of creating a tractor is we, we build momentum on a subconscious level for the, for the masses with visions that currently only exist in the minds of the visionaries. Realism creates viability. So how do we create an attractor? We start with the vision, we add dimension and realism to it, we build elements of purpose, we create relevance in the world we live in, rinse and repeat. We do it over and over again. We do it till we get it right. And then we unleash it on the world. We create this vision, we unleash it on the world, and we start influencing the influencers. We publish it, we get it out there. So once the concepts are in place, then we can use incentives and prizes and things like that to uh, build further awareness and to make it happen quicker. And step four is, is this idea of anticipatory analytics. When I talk about communicating with the future, communication is real simple. It's just signal sent, signal received. You send a signal and you receive a signal. The way we send a signal into the future is we take these visions, this body of work that we create about the future and we apply uh, keyword phrases to it, unique keyword phrases to these, these images, to these stories, and we begin the global conversation. Then we start monitoring the conversations by the use of these keywords. And so how often do these keywords start showing up? That's the signal received. So once a number of keyword phrases reaches critical mass in the global conversation, then we can determine when the vision's gonna become self-perpetuating, if we need to make some adjustments and start over, and when the market is gonna be ready for certain products in this particular category. So we all know about flying cars. We're all dreaming that we can someday just jump into a flying car and take off. The one on the top right, that one's mine. But nobody's talking about flying delivery drones. In my mind, there's a logical first step before we get to flying cars, and that's creating some flying delivery drone that can fly up and dock with your house and deliver packages and pizza and other things to your house. If you can imagine having FedEx on the side or UPS, it docks, delivers pizza, it will dock and take out the trash, it will take out the sewage, it will fly up to your house and actually change the batteries on your house. This, is, in my mind, is a logical first step. I wrote an article a few months ago about flying delivery drones. Before that time, there was virtually nothing, if you did a Google search on you got virtually nothing 
on that phrase, flying delivery drones. Right now, you'll get 1,550 results. You get that just because I wrote that article. I started the global conversation. Now, if we spend a lot of time doing graphics on this and a lot of time doing videos on this, suddenly the numbers would skyrocket. It becomes much more doable. So once there's a sufficient body of work and sufficient global conversation, our visions become self-perpetuating. And the vision will morph into exactly what the future wants. And we can suddenly start taking ownership of the future. So how much control of the future do we really have? We can ignite the spark. We can drive the vision. We can cause the world to take notice. We can implant new visions in the minds of the decision makers. And we can track the progress. And as a result of that, we can act on those results. This is a sizable amount of control. So rather than being blindsided by the future, we now have some tools that we can take some control over it. But seriously, how much control do we really have? The reality is, is that we have less than we want, but more than we think. And on that note, I will thank you for having me here today. Thank you very much. <laughs>